tell the different species based on the the distance between the curls, basically how uh, whether the spring is sort of flattened or opened more. It's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Oh, what I was saying, this is this, that looks like a more adult uh, metallic orgery on the left. Um, but as they, they start out, they don't have that same shape to them, the same flat top umbrella. Mm -hmm. um, they actually have a whole bunch of smaller branching down their main stem. Uh, but as yeah. they grow... Yeah, we gotta, that, I gotta get it further out in front here because it's steep and... Yeah. Good plan. Yeah. Um, but yeah, as they grow, um, those branches seem to come all merge together into that single sort of planar face. It's pretty cool. Very interesting. And as they grow, the uh, the uh, Bertle Star that's uh, associated with it also grows in size. So if they have a... They grow they up together. Yeah, they definitely have a relationship. Oh. It's, it's pretty amazing um, to see that. There's, there's a lot of there's so many associations of, of different organisms with these these you know beautiful sponges and, and corals and you know it's pretty amazing to see actually you know. Now we have some viewers trying to differentiate between some of these different uh, some of these different creatures, the oh, different uh, metallogorgias and crinoids and all the. All the all the different creatures we're seeing, but uh, any tips or tricks to distinguishing, making some quick IDs on some of what we're seeing as we as we move up the slope for those who are trying to ID things at home. All right, we're going into yeah, water so here. totally, Get our, all good. Get so, our bearings real quick. Um, we so one of the things about ID got is IDs is that it's really useful to have a guide. <laughs> yeah. So um, I recommend there's. Um, uh, Okeanos Explorer uh, Benthic Animal uh, ID Guide, um, and that is super useful. It has a lot of the different organisms that are seen on the deep sea. Um, and from there, you know, uh, so corals are part of the Nidarians. Um, like a little peak there. And then yeah. you can differentiate, you know, one of the reasons why we look at polyps is you can take a you can take a, you can right, use that now. to differentiate uh, between different groups, as well as the branching is really important for these chrysogorgids. Um, those beautiful, delicate um, polyps. Looking at the how they branch, the general shape, whether it's planar, so whether it's you know flat, sort of like a piece of paper, whether it's um, yeah, dendritic, so looks like a tree. Um, these are all very useful tools. And with those meridic uh, um, gorgia, looking at different species, you know, looking at how the axis, axis the main skeleton, the branch that connects to the seafloor, how that, um, how that twists. It's, it's pretty amazing, all the little details that it um. is. <laughs> it's not easy. There's, I mean, there's so much information, but so many varieties and uh, life on the seafloor so complex. People are often much more familiar yeah. with, you know, fish really species so or, fish. you know, yeah. the octopus, yeah. things that they might see more often uh, closer to the surface if they get to go in the ocean at those depths, or might they might see in aquariums if they get to visit those aquariums. But these deep sea creatures, uh, so rare to see and so much to learn about them. I love it. We have more questions. People uh, <laughs> people are wondering, are we gonna see any fish? The internet wants to know. And, and uh, you know, this, this isn't an aquarium. This is not, uh, we don't get to plan all of the, all of the encounters we're gonna have um, with uh, Kanaloa, with nature, with wildlife uh, down here in the deep sea, but almost can guarantee that before this dive is over, we're gonna encounter some fish. So. Um, just stay tuned. Might even see some some sharks. Uh, we've seen quite a few on our first dive, um, so so stay tuned. But a lot of people wondering about this marine snow. They're wondering what it's made of, um, what sort of determines 
uh, when you have a lot of marine snow and when you don't. Uh, any any uh, information on that you guys, you guys yeah. can share? Yeah, marine snow is this really amazing um, nutrient source for a lot of these deep sea animals. Um, and it's composed of um, uh, a lot of dead things and uh, a lot of recycled nutrients. So decaying and recycled nutrients, organic matter that um, sort of disperses and, and just sort of gravity is pulling it down to the bottom of the ocean. And so yeah. it's uh, yeah, interesting. It, it's pretty amazing. Um, and you know, the size of that, um, whether, whether it's uh, um, dying zooplankton or um, feces, you know, the size of that is really important for the animals because that means how quickly it falls. Um, to the sea floor because sometimes the sea floor is only getting you know less than you know 10 percent of the the surface um, surface nutrients. It's, uh, so in in spaces like this, marine snow and the amount of marine snow that you see in the currents, um, it can one be due to the uh, combined effort of the ROV movement with with the the current of the marine snow um, that is or the current that is taking the marine snow with it, but it can also just be indicative of, you know. What do we got there? Oh, can you yeah. Zoom in? Yeah, can we do a quick zoom on that, please? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Mushroom that's like coral. another mushroom Ooh. coral. Mm -hmm. And some, uh, looks like on the top, maybe some. Oh, yeah, that's beautiful. Right up at the very top of the screen, it looks like you can see a little bit of holothurian poo. Yep, so <laughs> that's what I mean. We'll have a lot of sea cucumbers probably <laughs> in the area. Around. That's awesome, thanks. Even so. their trails. Mm -hmm. Yeah, There's speaking of things that too. eat marine snow. Look yeah. at that beautiful mushroom. Wow. Oh, we've got some more fresh gorges too. So it looks like the rocks have the rocks have kind of changed a bit, uh, and yeah, that they're like larger. So these look like uh, Whoa. a lot of fragments of some smaller some pillow massive flows. sea star. Yes. Wow. That yeah, this huge. this looks like kind of kind of the toe of a lava field where things have kind of broken broken apart. Um, maybe a little bit of a tallest field even. So um, we may we may be coming up on some in place rocks uh, a little bit further uphill. Mm -hmm. And it's better for um, for understanding the um, geology to get a more in place rock that uh, maybe hasn't ideally. moved around. I mean, we can still learn a lot about seamounts from uh, uh, basically dredging, where we have very little stratigraphic control. Interesting. But uh, sampling via ROV, even if it is just float like this. Um, that, that uh, still gives us a lot of uh, uh, really valuable constraints on uh, like really what part of the seamount really we're likely to be sampling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't hear anything. My hearing's not so great, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, is it, if it's cranking. Yeah, so obviously with all the sediments yeah, around here, we're getting right. into a little bit of a flatter area as we approach uh, waypoint four, which is located uh, pretty much on top of the saddle point um, in part of the uh, rift zone structure. Where well, we it's have actually one, distorted already. <laughs> we have one uh, local peak and yeah. then another local peak and then there's a little bit of a dip between them and that's that's uh, oh, jargon in geology for fish. saddle point. Yeah. Kind of like a horse's saddle. We were looking for a fish, weren't we? There was one in the left <laughs> corner there. Yeah. Maybe I got there. away. Another sea star. Okay. Seen a few sea stars. Oh. You see red thing. We said so we have the internet wondering what the red thing was that dashed by. That's those are often shrimp. They're mm, quick moving mm -hmm. and jumping in front of the camera. But could be, could be uh, fish as well. Or fish have a reddish color when we shine our lights on them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the little red ones are most commonly those small shrimp. Yeah. yeah. Well, we got. What have we got here? Could be a Isn't that like a sea pen or something. Small sea pen. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. I think those are cool. Sea pens are one of the uh, 
um, Nadarians that are able to survive in, in sandy conditions like this. So it's pretty amazing. Um, so are they related to corals in some way? Yes, they are. They're, yeah. they're in the same family. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. looks like it with the polyps that they have. Yeah, exactly. It's it's pretty impressive. The uh, the expanse of the Nadarian family is they cover a lot of different morphologies. To be honest, yeah. Speaking yeah. of speaking of family, we all we all carry our families and communities with us on these expeditions, uh, not literally, but in our hearts mm -hmm. and um, in our minds. And we have some some viewers tuning in from all over the world. We love having you uh, from from Kurdistan. I saw that from Tallahassee. Let's go Seminoles oh, FSU. Wow. But also a special viewer, uh, a special viewer from Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, this is Catalina's Papito, and I'm sure that that message to her earlier was from one of her very excited aunties in Colombia. And uh, yeah, I, we must have set off a chain of uh, Catalina love. Oh, we got a shark here. Shark. Oh, oh yeah. Gee. Would it be possible to take a nice look at that one? Oh, wow. it's already sensed us and it doesn't like it. <laughs> it's an open out. Oh, wow, that's beautiful, though. It is beautiful. Oh, look at you. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. wow, coming oh, right to oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> Hey, buddy. He said, oh, there it goes. <laughs> I was wondering, oh man. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> oh, he likes our, the little cave right oh, under the camera. There's another eel like fish below there, too. Oh, yeah, there is another. <laughs> There you go, Internet. Oh, you, you asked for it. And there it you shall receive. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Conalo is feeling generous today. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. That's amazing. It actually, it's interesting, though. It, it doesn't look like the same type of fish that we've been seeing. Um, wow, it's got such beautiful, thin, um, those pectoral fins, on fins on it. Right? Yeah. yeah. Wow. And it's got, that's really interesting. Oh, you know what? I might go with, uh, due to solely how it's swimming. So, you know, low ID, um, that that has a very distinctive curve to the the swimming portion here, the the tail end. So I might I might say a question or halosaur there. It's a uh, that's pretty. They uh, they are also ones that don't really seem to they have a, a pointed tip and their hey. anal fin moves out like that. Um, and very clear pectoral fins. Where are we heading now? Uh, we are heading. Oh, those sore. Very cool. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, those are already some of my favorite to see because um, they're just so cool looking. And they swim, it's a very unique swimming style, which is kind of fun. Mm -hmm. Incredibly elegant and amazing how well adapted so many creatures are for living in this environment. It's so fun to see. Mm -hmm. It's so different from a lot of what we see up at the surface or on land, but also amazing to look at similar patterns. Notice some of that in our first dive. So Catalina, the family is so proud, and also Kukui, mom and dad from Maui, giving you a shout out online. Mm -hmm. Aww, I love it. This guys. is this is becoming a favorite part of my job here is uh, mm -hmm. just uh, sharing family love with everyone in the van. They're they're so proud of all of us. So all the ohana all and the Kukui ohana. actually helped to launch Hercules at midnight to mm -hmm. get her get him safely into the water and she was working on the deck so shout out to kukui mahalo for your kukua all of your help awesome I Le know legend is she lifted it with one hand and then just <laughs> 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 the whole ROV and just 
right on the other side mm. into the water. Mahalo, Kukui. Oh, mahalo, you guys. And Zach and Bob did an amazing job guiding the ROV in the water, mm. kept it safe, kept it um, out of the harm's way. And Megan, always amazing. And our amazing deck chief, Ken, and everybody who is on the ROV team and the deck team. Such amazing, amazing people to work with. Mm -hmm. Such an incredible team effort. Uh, that's right. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, for, for any, anyone who's wondering, Hercules does weigh about 6,500 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> that's about Kukui's max. That's what yeah, I would imagine it's pretty tough. To <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got another one of those big shrimp. Big oh, shrimp. Oh, big shrimp. Yeah, wow. big shrimp. <laughs> Add that to the shrimp count. <laughs> Val, we've got some questions coming in about the samples that we got from yesterday's or two days ago, um, and wondering what it, uh, what the sediment smelled like. What did some of the, what did some of the things we brought up smell like? Does the deep sea have a lot of aroma? Uh, it can. Uh, I was, I've been mostly handling the rocks, so, uh, I mean, they'll smell like rocks. <laughs> uh, but yeah, they, 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 uh, I'm not sure who processed the sediment, but. Um, Sometimes that can have a little bit of a smell, but not really uh, much that I remember. Um, Pressures that deep might squeeze the smell right out. <laughs> <laughs> Something like here. that. Yeah. Yeah. One of the ones that uh, I always have a little trouble with, as far as smell goes, are sponges. Sponges uh, can sometimes have a really powerful smell to them. Ooh. They do seem to have a, lo it's a little a, weird. There's a lot of bacteria that are associated with sponges and. Uh, I imagine there's there's a lot going on with those that can create any number of um, smells. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. yeah, I was looking up um, some of the deep sea sponges online and it turns out that there is some biomedical research going on with the um, some of the bacteria, I believe, or some of the chemical compounds that are fun associated with sponges. Yeah. So it's incredible work. Yeah, it's really interesting. Sponges. Sponges are um, a very old, you know, uh, group of organisms, and they host some really, some real mysteries to them. They're, um, it's really quite interesting, the studies that, that are going on with the, the, the different proteins that they create. Um, as w as well as the uh, different bacteria hosts and their exceptional filter feeders, c just collecting uh, yes. DNA and portions of the marine snow and such. So they can. There's some studies that have used them to look into the different taxa in the environment around them, which I think is so fascinating. Ah, oh, that's incredible. Yeah. And I'm just like, I'm blown away on how, especially glass sponges can withstand the pressure of such deep depths and how they're able to grow all the, those glass spicules that they have and create all this, this beautiful framework that is, that is a home to so many other associates, um, especially shrimp and um, brittle stars and you know, commonly we see all of these associations like hanging out rent free in these glass sponges. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, you know, and these these glass sponges, they're such important habitats, and they're they're at depths that you know you can dive to around you know 30 feet, um, you know, in in scuba gear as well as you know as as deep as um, you know. I think they're known from depths to over 20,000 feet, which is far deeper than we are currently. Um, yeah. That's about 6,000 meters or so. So it's a, it's amazing to get to see them throughout that expansive depth range and in all of their shapes and sizes and important habitats. So they can create grounds, sponge grounds, that have really high diversity of associated taxa as well. Um, yeah, it's so, so I'm going to jump in just for a second here. Absolutely. Totally 
different subject, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, one thing I've been kind of puzzling over, and uh, actually uh, Hannah, who just got off watch, has been puzzling over too, is why the rocks are so flat around here. Mm. I'm not exactly sure why, but I'm wondering if it's a really thin uh, sheet flow that's been breaking up, because it looks like uh, in the uh, upper half of, uh, our, of Hurt Cam that it's a little bit more intact uh, up there. Right. So I think we might be looking at the margin of some sort of a sheet flow that's been slowly breaking apart and slightly sloughing downhill over the years. Interesting. Yeah, probably really right. thin. Look at that. Yeah, probably really thin sort of lava flow. And it looks, it's hard to say what its relationship to the sedimentation is because that most likely that happens a little bit uh, after it's, it, it can be hard to build in sediment or uh, deposit sediments uh, to any significant degree between eruptive activities until you get into the very late stages of the volcano. But I'm guessing a lot of the sedimentation happened well after uh, the volcanism kind of shut down. So it's hard to tell what exactly is going on here with these lava flows between the sediments. Wow, that is a that is really cool. That is also a wild looking. Is this a nudibranch again? <laughs> or a sea cucumber? <laughs> I'm gonna go with sea cucumber. I, I don't have a dog sure. in this fight because yeah. uh, I don't know I don't know my animals very well. That's interesting. I, you know, you can't see the feet of it. It's you can't see the face of it, so it's pretty difficult to tell. They both tend to have these ridges on them. Of oops, they both have lines sometimes down their backs like yeah. that, and they can have. They both can have sort of those external features. So um, yeah, that's really interesting. One thing I'm noticing is that there's some potentially two feet down there. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. I might, I might lean towards a sea cucumber, but it's uh, yeah, so awesome. And another uh, key feature about uh, nudibranchs actually is like the the paired rhinophores at the front, which I I believe is probably what the viewers saw last night on our on our big debate mm. as well. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, they're able to use that kind of feature to kind of distinguish between the two. Yeah. Um, and a lot of deep sea cucumbers like this have those external appendages. I forget what they're called, but they're usually used for like kind of feeling around. I believe the water column. Yeah. I don't know if like anything can see anything down here or <laughs> if they have like really evolved eyesight but like especially with sea cucumbers since they don't have a developed nervous system um, or even eyes for that matter they yeah. usually rely on these sense um, sensory appendages to kind of help them out a little bit yeah they and they have uh, feeding tentacles which is something I was looking for um, and uh, I know that you can differentiate different uh, species and different groups by their um, the morphology of their mouths. So the, the different characteristics and shapes of those tentacles. Um, and actually, it's really interesting. They can the different shape of their mouth parts can mean that they actually utilize different sized uh, sediment. Um, they're able to sift through different grain sizes, they utilize different types of foods. It's pretty amazing. Um, All right, so we're approaching waypoint four in that little saddle area. So we've got a little bit further uphill to go and then we should Excellent. see a pretty small area of some uh, relatively flat terrain. And then we'll uh, we'll keep moving uphill. But yeah, let's, yeah, I'm excited to see what's on the saddle because uh, one thing I found in my years as a geologist doing some mapping on land and looking at a few of these saddle points on dives, more often than not, there's something interesting there. You just don't necessarily know what that interesting thing will be. Mm -hmm. dun, dun, dun. Yep. <laughs> well, we've got a, a great question coming from some of our viewers um, on Moko Keawe on the Big Island. Um, they're just uh, excited to be in Papahanaumokuakea with us, but they're curious about how these ancient volcanoes and kind of the um, the mineral composition and the structures, how are these similar or different to what we're used to seeing, you know, on land, say at Kilauea or on Mokokiawe with the, with the active volcano there? Oh, that's an awesome question. So there are some similarities, but there are also some differences too. Um, 
So you see a lot of similarity in kind of the shapes of some of these uh, lava flows uh, that you might get from Mauna Kea or Mauna Loa. Uh, they they, they kind of get those those twisty little lobes of uh, uh, lava that erupt, uh, kind of travel downhill in a lot of in a lot of cases. And something very similar is happening here, but. Uh, uh, it being in a pretty cold environment surrounded by water, uh, the, uh, the lavas that erupt in these submarine settings actually develop a glass rind because they, uh, okay. in contact with water, they, uh, they cool down so quickly that they don't have time to crystallize around the, uh, around the rims like uh, uh, some of the Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea uh, lavas will do. Right. And you still, you still get those crusts around, uh, around uh, terrestrial lavas, but um, it's not as... Uh, pronounced, I would say, as, uh, as what we see here uh, underwater. So those glassy rinds can be some, usually about a centimeter to a centimeter half thick, and it's it's a little bit thinner on land. And, okay. uh, you know, you get you get changes in how much uh, dissolved gases like CO2 or water or uh, sometimes a little bit of uh, fluorine or chlorides. Uh, those, those still degas underwater under certain circumstances, but perhaps not the same way as uh, uh, degassing of those uh, lavas happens on the surface. Um, as far as the mineralogy goes, um, there's a little bit of difference at times with uh, what we sample from the Hawaiian Islands and uh, Kamaehua, uh, excuse me, Kamaehua, I'm stumbling over my words, Kamaehua Kanaloa, formerly known as uh, Loihi Seamount. Those, ha those tend to have a lot of uh, olivines that crystallize out of them. So those very green crystals that you'll sometimes see in uh, uh, Hawaiian rocks. Mm -hmm. uh, here, sometimes we see uh, very similar rock types that just mostly crystallize out olivine, if anything at all. Yeah. And then uh, uh, on some of these, we'll actually see another mineral phase that crystallizes out called clinopyroxene. And they're these black crystals. Um, and when you get this occurrence of olivine and clinopyroxene inside the rock, uh, that, that ends up with a really striking appearance. And I that, bet. It's that's, beautiful. It is. Something we call an ankeramite. Ankeramite. And those, those are, ankeramites can be relatively common uh, at uh, a number of seamounts worldwide. But at Hawaii, they're a little bit less common. And that has to do with the, you know, what kind of source mantle composition you're melting to form these lavas. Uh, and uh, sometimes how much of that you're melting. So here, probably we're melting a little bit less of the mantle source, and that can change some of the chemical, uh, some of the chemistry of it, and what, you know, mineral phases are likely to start crystallizing out of it, yeah. compared to Hawaii, where you have a much uh, higher degree of melting. You're melting more of that mantle source. Oh, got it. That's awesome. So I'm there are a lot gonna... of similarities and some differences. Oh, I'm just gonna mahalo. interject here real quick and uh, talk yeah, about what's this on screen, beautiful Virginia. bamboo in front of us. Um, we have uh, Scott. France joining us from ashore who mentioned that this is a type of candelabrum cor uh, bamboo. You can tell it's a bamboo by those uh, the black nodes and um, and the where it's um, branching from is really important as well. So these sort of whether it's branching from the nodes or not and then the polyps themselves. This is one of the one of my favorite types of bamboos to come across actually because they're just so stunning and very striking. It's really wonderful. And Scott's pretty excited about this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Awesome. Yes, and the trident branching at the center was what uh, Scott France mentioned was so important. It is just like a candelabra. Look at that. It's a beautiful specimen. Well mm -hmm. done, bamboo coral. Mm -hmm. Nice form. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so cool. It's so wonderful to have people ashore who are who are studying these organisms at a, at a deeper level than maybe some of us on board are, are studying them. It's uh, awesome Definitely to have me. people ashore. Definitely me, I the rocks. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm really lucky that I, uh, I study ecology, so I, I'm looking into all the different reasons why we see these different habitats and these different specimen in different locations. I think it's absolutely fascinating that right now we actually aren't seeing that many, um, we aren't seeing the abundance of corals that we saw yesterday and that yesterday we saw such an, um, you know, on dive H2002, we saw such different diversity and across the whole 
full depth range. That really excites me because I'm like, why are there, what, what are, what's causing these differences? Is it depth? Is it food? You know, it's, it's amazing. In. Mm. There's also that 17 hour transit to account for too. So yeah. spatially there can be a lot of differences. We tend to see things very different uh, from, you know, things change a lot seamount to seamount and even on different parts of seamounts. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So it'll be really interesting. Uh, sounds like a really interesting topic uh, to try to figure out why. And probably there are more questions than answers. I think there are. Definitely yeah. there are more oh, questions. Oh, they just all retracted. Did you oh, see that? Oh, that's so cool. Just floop. <laughs> <laughs> they felt our presence. Yeah. Do you think they like actually that? make that floop sound? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely. 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 Sound effects. <laughs> Definitely. But they probably still do it in Hawaiian, though. Yeah. It's an ole, it's an olelo Hawaii floop. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so what is olelo Hawaii for uh, floop? Floop. Kukui mana o na o. <laughs> That's a very good question. Hino, Hino, Mahina, you guys have in, in, uh, input? <laughs> I, I don't. I don't. Yeah, I'm uh, gonna have to gonna have to go ask. Ask yeah. some Kumo about that one. It's funny, I think that's something across the board when I've been speaking to different scientists on Nautilus, um, when they're explaining certain things that we're experiencing and seeing down at the bottom, whether it's rocks or some of the marine life, there's always sound effects <laughs> <laughs> in explanations. So I think that's really awesome. And I always uh, make it a, a point to ask them to uh, make the sound effect sound again, just so I can, you know, <laughs> correlate that with my understanding and comprehension of what they're trying to explain. That's right. But um, I just stepped out of the uh, control van recently, and I saw a beautiful Anue Anue, a beautiful rainbow at the stern of Ooh. Nautilus. So Hi. yes, to one of our viewers, this is a very beautiful Wawakua. This is a very beautiful realm of Kanaloa. Um, Olaikeo a Kanaloa. So live to the realm of Kanaloa and to many of our viewers too, um, as Dr. Val was just mentioning, there's a lot of different things we'll see in the sea mounds or the Monokai. They'll vary um, depending on where we are. And I mean, the ocean is so vast, it's so deep. There's so many things that we still don't know about it, like Dan had mentioned in an earlier watch. So just keeping that in mind, um, whatever we see is a blessing. So whether it's fish or the nudies or <laughs> shrimp. Um, yeah, we're just really grateful to be out here exploring. So mahalo for joining us in Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. Um, this is our second ROV dive uh, with Hercules and Atalanta. And as we mentioned earlier in this watch, Kukui just lifted Hercules <laughs> with her with one arm and you know, Got it in the water. <laughs> Legends oh. are born. Oh. Yeah. Legends are born. Oh, mahalo, guys, and mahalo you know, to, to Ked and Zach and Bob and Megan for uh, yeah. allowing me to join them and their awesome um, teamwork and launching Atlanta and Hercules safely. <laughs> it's really one of the one of the great joys of being on this uh, ship and working with this team on Nautilus is watching all of the opportunities for learning and jumping in and working together as teams and. Um, also the incredible uh, just humility and grace and generosity of everyone on board, but especially our young, younger crew members who are exceptionally talented, um, but just really here to learn. It, and uh, it makes it so much, so much more fun when everyone is just excited to learn. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just thought it might be a good to throw some specs out on uh, Hercules. It does weigh um, about uh, 6,500 pounds mass, <laughs> so um, it's a it's a bit heavy, but also neutrally buoyant. Yes, or yeah, it's slightly less uh, than water. Right, which yeah, is yeah, we're but we're about 35 pounds positive, so, so it's floating. Wow, that is what impressive. That? That's those big foam uh, yellow blocks on top that mm -hmm. you see. They're yeah. they're designed to uh, just keep Hercules in just the right position, just floaty enough. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, it's not going to go crashing down, but we can also maneuver and control it, or we cannot, but uh, masters <laughs> like Bob can. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it's it's quite a large vehicle. It's uh, 12 feet by about six um, wide, and it's uh, seven foot tall. 
almost uh, almost 12, so it's taller than a lot of us, or yeah, almost eight feet, sorry. <laughs> um, you know, taller than a lot of us on board. So it's uh, it's pretty pretty mag amazing to see it. Are you just zooming? So oh yeah. Another Chrysler Wow. Yeah, look at that. And it's got a, what is that? A, it's got another crustacean inside. Oh. Mm. Can we get a zoom on that crustacean, actually? Yeah, those associates are pretty common. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This may be one of the species that we're targeting, actually. Uh, is it? Shrimp. Is um, it okay if we hold here for a moment, front yeah. row? Yeah, 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 for, for sure. A okay, cool, thank you. Yeah, you can see the orange. Uh, uh, let's see, posterior region and a translucent, transcending into a translucent um, anterior region. I could try and get closer if you want to get a good if can, look at it. Can you zoom out? All right, I called up to Bridge to see if we can hold for a second. I know it might drag us along for a little bit, but try and give us a minute here. Mm -hmm. All right, zoom in. So we're potentially interested in a piece of this coral? Um, we're potentially interested in the shrimp. Oh, in the shrimp, coral. okay. Yes. Okay. Ooh, that could be a tricky yeah. catch. Well, yeah. we actually haven't taken a, a sample of this type of coral here, and this is, um, and actually they didn't take a sample of this last year either. We were kind of chucking along, though, so... Well, I just I just called up to bridge to hold. Yeah, um, but that's, you know... And now we're going to swing forward a little bit. Yeah, yeah I think quite a bit. Are know. we going to... I mean, is this is this a sample that maybe we want to get bridge to, like, back up a little bit for? Uh, do we want to back up a bit for collection? We, we need to decide pretty quick. <laughs> it is a target species, and we want... Um, that that shrimp we think is a target species. Yeah, can we back yeah. up the ship a little bit? Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Bridge now. And so I've been told this species is uh, a little can fast. You switch this over to sample jar. Can, yes, sir. Yeah. Did you do the salvo? Do you need me to do it? Yeah. You okay. got. You did it. Can you zoom out? Yeah. Switch the camera over. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll I'll do the sample uh, salvo. Okay. Do you know where your buttons are for that? Oh, or yeah, not that. Oh, it's right here. Yeah. Oh. Uh, don't switch that. I need the I need to see the sample jar. So go to your here. I'll do it. There we go. All right, I did. Uh, okay, uh, can you put that on sample jar? What are we on? Uh, number five. Oh, shit, let's see. Do you want to flush it first? Uh, oh. Yeah, go for it. And then yeah, we need a truck, though. Okay. I'll flush it while you're together. Sampling is always a little tricky. Mm -hmm. um, These are supposed to be fast critters, too. A lot of coordination, and we also just want to remember that this is. Uh, this is Kanaloa's realm, and we're so grateful for the opportunity to continue to learn about it. We do the best we can to sample can we zoom in? as responsibly as possible. Hand it over to operations, but uh, are we lined up on the jar? You, can guy. you switch over to the yes, jar? Sir. Whatever jar we're getting to. Five? We need jar to get number five. Here. Yes. Yeah, get it. So it goes. It's it's got an index, so it'll kind of ding ding. There we go. Okay, what do, you, what do you got the suction at? 70. Okay. We got him. See, we got him. Oh, no, Ooh. there he is. Oh, we got him. <laughs> pretty, they're pretty tricky. Yeah, they're really, really fast. <laughs> it's still below slurp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Still below oh, slurp. Oh, oh. oh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? Some things. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, that's okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll keep our eyes peeled yeah. for additional specimen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Great. Oh, it's still right there. It's just <laughs> teasing us. <laughs> Kanaloa can be like that trying sometimes. To, yeah. Yeah. Trying to hide under the basket. <laughs> <laughs> hey, any port in a storm, right? <laughs> Well, it's awesome. like right when you think you're in the perfect spot for catching the wave, and then all of a sudden you're not. Yeah. And oh, Kalo, no. Kalo likes to do that yeah, to us. And you learn real quick. You you learn learn quickly. Quickly. Shrimp count plus one. Hi, good morning, Asako. How are you doing? Mm -hmm. Well, thanks. Thanks, pilots. That was, you know. A good shot. Yeah. 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 We almost, quick. We almost had the little one. Mm -hmm. okay. But yeah, now we know what our target species look like, so it's right. a really We're good We're getting uh, yanked. So. Great. Yep, yeah, totally let's get a move thanks. on then. Thanks uh, Thanks for that. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for your a quick action. Man, super tricky. tricky. Guys. Mm -hmm. All right, looks mm -hmm. like we're going to start making our way towards waypoint five, kind of alongside a ridge here. All right, so one thing we're on the lookout for, just in case we see it, um, are some nodule fields. So those will be of interest to our uh, colleagues working on manganese crusts. So if, op if the opportunities are right, Bridge we now. see something come don't, up. Don't we'll try look. and turn around because you're going to yank on me. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I don't know. fish. I see it. Video system is not doing very good with the composite <laughs> video anymore. Uh -uh. So on the subject of uh, terminology and such from a few minutes ago, it's practically a technical term these days in mantle geochemistry to describe things as blobs. <laughs> yes. And I love it. Blob. <laughs> okay. That's awesome. So how do all these, uh, are, are, would these be considered blobs that we're seeing right now? Uh, perhaps. I, I think we're seeing a, a few pieces of some uh, pillow basalts. And uh, what look like kind of thinner uh, lava flows that have been breaking up. Um, yeah, with, uh, the blobs tend to be things that we think are entrained into the mantle plumes that form uh, the seamount tracks like this. And you know, uh, there's some people who've uh, uh, suggested that you might get discrete little blobs of this compositionally distinct material coming up in the conduit. And maybe, and maybe those are related to uh, a, uh, a single volcanic system or a seamount that forms. Because what we see often is that uh, you, in some of these hotspot tracks that are really well studied, like the Hawaiian Islands, you can see uh, each island has kind of its own distinct compositional signatures to it. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of overlap uh, between, between them, so we can kind of tell they're all related uh, isotopically. But... Um, Sometimes they have they, they erupt out a uh, fraction of their uh, their lavas that um, you know may have a distinctly radiogenic signature or vice versa compared to some of the other ones, and uh, that's that's been a really interesting subject of study in the last few years. Oh. Even um, different mountains on the same island too, yeah, have different isotopic signatures as well. Yeah, yeah, like uh, Oahu, for example. Mm -hmm. um, you, you can see uh, part of the so-called uh, uh, double chain in the plume uh, where you get some uh, uh, isotopic compositions uh, uh, in one of the volcanoes that looks very different than uh, some of the others, so like uh, Waianae versus uh, Ko'olau. And there is a small sequence of lavas in uh, the Ko'olau side of Oahu that uh, uh, actually has um, some of the most extreme uh, versions of uh, a very compositionally distinct mantle type that uh, the Hawaiian hotspot samples. So mm. I think I think that pops out, like similar versions of that pop out yeah, in a couple of point. other islands too, but yep. it's particularly strong in a very small part of Oahu. And so 
sorry, another question. Um, oh, why, questions are great. So why, if they're coming from the same hotspot, why do they have different um, signatures like that? Is it because of how old they are and then the chemical makeup kind of changes or is it something else? So in Hawaii, uh, there, there are some changes that we know happen uh, as a function of uh, uh, how young or old the seamount is. Um, part of it is also that we think the plume is uh, sampling a couple of different kinds of uh, mantle at its base, like where it's taking things up, and there there can be some heterogeneities within that source too, because uh, you know this is this is very viscous lower mantle uh, nope. convecting solid material that uh, we think it's taking up, and that um, that doesn't really mix very efficiently, and there are also some heterogeneities that will. Uh, be easier to melt than others. So in cert under certain melting conditions, we may be uh, able to express some of those extreme compositions much better. And then some other stuff during, uh, like when, when you're melting uh, your mantle source more extensively, there's some other signatures that will become more dominant too. So it's, oh. it's really complex. Yeah, it's the same awesome. shrimp. Yeah, the, uh, and it tells us a lot about what ha what's happening. Good eye, Robert. Yeah. Does the battle continue? Um, I can't see the anterior side as well, but uh, yep. Yeah. That's, that's the boot. Yeah. Yep. So we <laughs> we were advised that, um, oh, wait, um, we have, someone has said in the, that this might be a female carrying um, brooded oh, embryos yeah. on her oh, oh, swim oh, legs. Oh, oh, and that's oh, the yeah, purple, oh, that's the purple that we see there. Oh, so okay. Okay. Zoom in I think more. Yeah, let's just get a quick zoom. Oh, wow. She's it's the Makuhine mother. Hey, mama. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we don't want to sample yeah. no. anyone carrying yeah. a clutch. Awesome, thank you for that good eye, Scott. Appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, that's a good spot. Yeah. Wow, that's so amazing. Wow. So that's a whole future generation there. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of these animals put a lot of effort into um, uh, their young and, and brooding them, wow. so to speak. Um, especially crustaceans, though, under their carapace, like you can see, or not under their carapace, under their swimming, around their swimming legs. They'll hold on to those, those eggs. Um, until they're ready, um, you know. Yeah. yeah. Resting until they can, uh, they can hatch some more future opai. Yeah. Interesting, yeah. Um, Shrimp counters are going wild. Uh -huh. <laughs> All these babies. Yeah. Are they so counting amazing. the babies? I mean, <laughs> they're, they're, they're just thinking about how lucky they'll be in however many weeks when they get to, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know the life cycle of these shrimp, but whenever they get to try to count them. <laughs> so cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, Scott France also mentioned that uh, these, it's actually pretty common to see brooding females in this, uh, in these chrysogorgids. So that's really exciting to see. It's where the mamas like to hang out. Mm -hmm. wow. In the chrysogorgia. Chrysogorgias hey. do look very comfy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. All right. We're ready to move? That was a great zoom. Mahalo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's really cool to see. You know, it's sometimes it's uh, the reproduction of these animals is. So sometimes it's not something that you observe very often because sometimes it's internal, sometimes it's, you know, um, at different parts of the season. So it's um, pretty interesting. Looks like we've uh, got another we do, fish there. Could we do a quick zoom on the smaller, the, uh, the smaller rocks in here? Just to see if these uh, look like uh, nodules. Zoom in. Yes, please. to say there might be a couple of nodules but a lot of these look like fragments too um would we would we have enough time to do a quick scoop on some of these uh, or do move. we need to move i mean i can get us to hold if you want okay uh, yeah yeah, right. yeah. Not really, there's no, yeah. It's just, it takes too long to happen like okay the stopping do you want me to call it 10 up? minutes no we're no? just gonna go okay yeah, if we gotta go we gotta go no, I mean, we're going to, 
We're going to try and get something. <laughs> yeah, so we're scooping. Yep. Can you see that? I was wondering if there would be nodules on the saddle point. That's where we seem to find them uh, often. I mean, they, they could be they could be nodules that have nucleated on uh, rock fragments from the nearby lava flows too. So it's it can be a little hard to determine just visually. So if we if we get some good examples, uh, uh, and some and a couple of bigger ones come up in the scoop, I'll cut them open uh, later and see uh, see what's inside. For those who are for those who are uh, listening, maybe for the first time or, or haven't really gotten to tune into a lot of the geology, what's What's the difference between fragments and nodules? What's uh, what's what's going? What are we looking for exactly here? Um, so this is uh, this is to complement some research that uh, some of our colleagues at USGS are doing to investigate the compositions and distributions of different kinds of ferromanganese crusts on the ocean floor. And here we're interested in information about what we're preserving in the monument and helping map out some of these uh, crust locations uh, that have been getting mapped out elsewhere around uh, the ocean basin. And uh, uh, yeah, sometimes you get these rock fragments, like little pieces of rock that broke off of these lava flows. And sometimes if that happens uh, early enough, you'll get a pretty thick manganese crust around those. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some others that we've cut open on uh, previous cruises elsewhere in the uh, uh, elsewhere in the Pacific, where sometimes you'll you'll find those rock fragments inside, or some other material. Yep. Uh, and then uh, sometimes you see nothing. I can't dig down very far. Is the sediment really thin? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm just scraping along the surface here. Gotcha. Okay, I gotta move ahead anyway. Okay, no worries. I'll keep Thank the you. scoop in hand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that sediment makes these nodules really hard to pick up because it's just so easily disturbed. It's such a fine sediment. Mm. And if it's if it's a thinner sediment too, that adds to uh, uh, the sampling technique. <laughs> because uh, it, it can be a little, in thinner sediments, it's harder to get those nodules to go into the scoop. Sure. The scoop doesn't have a very fine edge on it. It's a yeah. Thick edge, well, it doesn't. So Dr. Val, I must ask, did you find, uh, did you find anything that you're interested in from your pohaku, your rocks that you got uh, collected from our last dive? Yeah, we got some great rocks. Um, basically, we had two types that we found uh, on that first dive. The first one is um, a uh, kind of red-brown rock that mm -hmm. has seen quite a bit of alteration, uh, which we can tell by some discoloration on the outer edges of the rock once we cut it open. And it uh, doesn't have a lot of crystals or anything in it. I think mm -hmm. I saw one clinopyroxene yesterday. Uh, so I'm trying to figure out what exactly kind of lava flow uh, that might be, and sometimes that can be really hard with rocks where you don't see a lot of uh, a lot of crystals in them. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll work on that this afternoon and see if we can figure it out. But otherwise, we'll have to send it to a lab for chemical analysis. Mm -hmm. And then the second group that we found were um, what are what are known as olivine basalts. Uh, and in this case, there actually isn't a ton of olivine that you can see, but it falls into that category chemically. And it's uh, got some vesicles or where some uh, gas has bubbled out of the lava after it erupted. Mm -hmm. And uh, those, those are really good for us uh, for uh, uh, geochemical work, uh, sometimes for geochronology work, but it's always a little bit of a question if uh, that's gonna work out okay 
in uh, rocks this old where we can't pull some uh, other phases out that work well, like clinopyroxene or hornblende or plagioclase. So, uh, yeah, I thought we got some really interesting stuff. I was happy with that. Yeah. <laughs> Bob, we have a question online wondering if we ever use the second arm on Hercules or if that's just, you know, a backup. Uh, the, what's good about the, the magnum arm is that uh, all the joints are locked so that you can hold on to something and you don't have to... Uh, yeah, it's just good for holding things. Sample collection, otherwise we need that mobility so that we yeah. can get stuff in the jar and do delicate maneuvers. But this, the, the second arm, is, I think Herc's left yeah. arm, really good yeah. for holding stuff in place. Yeah, if the, if the craft, our primary, the starboard manipulator, uh, if you take hydraulic power away from it, it just goes limp. Mm -hmm. So you can't really hold on to things, you'll lose them, drop them. Mm. So what are, what's an example of something you've used that arm for then? Um, a lot of times like holding a sampler in mm. through recovery. Um, what are other things? Uh, we were, we were trying to measure corals and we had a, uh, I guess you can't call it a wiffle ball. We get in trouble when we say that. <laughs> <laughs> a plastic ball, kids balls with holes in it. <laughs> and that was a reference size thing. Oh, that's great. So it was like on the end of a wand and we were holding it out there with that manipulator. But I don't know, uh, like sometimes if you come up like on a wellhead or something, you want to hold yourself in position, you can grab a hold of it with that arm to hold you in place. Nice, sounds very useful actually. Mm -hmm. Two different, two different arms with two very different uses, which is important when you're. Yeah, Alvin has sort of a same sort of setup too. They, uh, they, ha they have two good manipulators. The, they use a Schilling T4, which is pretty similar to the craft. But they also go back to an old uh, ISC arm, similar to that one, to the port arm just because of its ability to stay in position when the hydraulics are turned off. Mm. Sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, These, the ROVs are really interesting. Um, such large and intricate pieces of equipment. Yes, with their wiffle balls. I mean, <laughs> 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 yeah, that's true. No, they are. It's a really, really amazing. We, we're so thankful. Oh, for another shrimp. Hey, shrimp. For her. All right, I'm going to put the scoop away because it doesn't look yeah, like sounds we're in good. the scoop zone here. I, I, was just, I, I totally agree with you there. <laughs> Looking at that shrimp reminded me of an earlier question, Virginia, from some of our online viewers. Oh, yeah. uh, an ecology question about where these shrimp fit in the food chain in the deep sea what are they eating and and what's eating oh, them yeah isn't that interesting um you know shrimp shrimp are not something that i particularly study however um they do typically have various um they often i believe uh, shrimp often are eating um you know small pieces of food i think some might eat small copepods and such um detritus things that are have fallen between, you know, between polyps of a of a coral, etc. Um, but I imagine that the they're probably pretty tasty snacks for a lot of those fish that we've seen, um, especially the larger fish, like um, maybe the angler fish, which has, you know, that that large, large mouth that can kind of suction things into. That Perfect seems for like eating a, a shrimp. Yeah. Yeah. And now sure. I'm I'm not positive. I'd have to do. I'm, I'm not a fish fish biologist nor a shrimp biologist, but um, yeah, I know, um, but also I know some of these things can really be surprising. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. 
Yeah, everything has a place in that food chain, and a lot of it goes back to that marine snow and then all these organisms that are filtering food uh, from the water column, and then, mm -hmm. you know, the shrimps are probably just a level above that, um, you know, consuming some of those filter-feeding organisms. We did have uh, we did have someone comment in who was watching the ONC cruise, the Ocean Networks Canada cruise, saying that that port arm that we were just talking about is is uh, really helpful for holding equipment um, yeah. for delivery up and down on the seafloor when they uh, when they're doing all of that work on the seismic network and cables and sensors out there um, off the coast of uh, British Columbia. So. Mm -hmm. Get sees a little more action maybe on uh, uh, cr those cruises up there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's always interesting to see what what's what's around in this area. We are uh, currently traveling. We're at about fifteen hundred meters of depth. We're We've been moving along. We've been moving along this uh, similar um, depth zone for a few meters. We've gone. Oh, what do we have like here? Yeah. Oh, that's wild looking. Could we get a quick zoom on that, yeah. please? Zoom in. Is um, that two things there. at once? What is this? Oh, it's an urchin. Oh, oh no, it's an oh, 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 that is. Oh, I know, but I'm. Yes, Beautiful. that looks like one of those yeah. tube anemones, but it's a uh, Are those on our wish list at all? Uh, I don't believe so. Okay. Yeah. Oh, wow, that is a, that is quite the specimen. Wow. Yeah. wow. And the Olala Hawaii word for sea anemone is Ola or Okala. It's pretty. What a beautiful yeah. color. Hello. That yeah. is really beautiful. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Could a could a tube anemone like this uh, take out one of those shrimp? Oh, I uh, I don't know. I wouldn't 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 pass by. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it looks like this might be a yeah serianthid anemone. Um, Ah, Scott France. Scott France is of is of two minds. Oh, Could possibly retract in the tube of disturb, but possibly a shrimp eater. So you know, oh. possibly. I I uh, I have to agree. Unknown. <laughs> well, we would have to see. If it. you are a shrimp, beware. Just mm -hmm. uh, move carefully. Mm -hmm. Sounds like good life life advice. <laughs> <laughs> good life advice. Wow, that's beautiful. Yeah, absolutely stunning. Thank you. Good eye. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. right, so at the moment, we're following uh, a contour over toward uh, waypoint five. So, excuse me, we're going to stay put uh, approximately 1,500 meters or slightly below for uh, a little while here. And then we'll start, uh, let's see. And after that, we'll start heading uphill a little bit more. If we have any teachers or classrooms or students, uh, parents uh, tuning in with us uh, this morning, we would love to connect with your school, with your classroom, uh, or even with your workplace and your colleagues and uh, special ship to shore interactions that we can do from the studio that's just behind us here in the control van. And um, it's always a highlight talking directly with audiences who are interested in the deep sea with us. So. I know we have a lot of fans watching on YouTube and watching on Nautilus Live, but if you'd like to be uh, have a little bit more personal uh, invitation into the control van, um, we'd love to have you sign up. You can find the sign-up form on the NautilusLive.org site under the Education tab. Got a fan of something there. Mm -hmm. Zoom in. Speaking of fans. <laughs> <laughs> Sight on. Oh yeah. Oh, and another urchin. Right oh, and that. an urchin underneath too. 
Oh, sneaky, eh? Yeah, it looks like we can't see the, the body of it, but that's wonderful. Sea star in it, too, or a brittle star. Mm -hmm. Is this another Corallid? In the Corallides, yeah. It's a... That's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, so this is a talus slope that we're moving across right now where a lot of rocks have broken off of some uh, lava flows further up slope. And this is gonna be a lot of loose rubble. So um, there are fewer, fewer really reliable holdfasts for these uh, corals and some of the, and sponges and some of the other uh, creatures that we're going to see here. So it's going to be a little bit more sparse in this area. Is that another holothurian oh, yeah, of we some do. sort? Right here. Oh, yeah. We've seen a couple. Um, it's a beauty. Yeah. Mean? Oh. That one. All right, sea cucumber lovers. Is there any cool. sediment in the stomach? <laughs> <laughs> Show us your guts. Oh, yeah. fantastic. Oh, wow. It's got kind of a mohawk going there. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Like oh, yeah, that's, that's, oh, yeah, that's Soul Sister Vals. Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, there's Rockstar and Soul Sister Val. We've got, mm -hmm. uh, we got it all here in the control van. That's what yeah. a beauty. One's got some style. Yeah. 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 Wow. Nice friend. Very Got cool. a good look there. Yeah, that's awesome. Looking like maybe a... Yeah, probably a synalactid. There's oh. another branched whip coral, right? Oh, oh that one's noise. interesting. Yeah. Super cool. One. Is that another bamboo? Zoom in. I think it's yeah. another bamboo. See the black stripes? Yeah, but it's got a really weird... Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Wow, we've got a beautiful a station on it as well. Yeah, squat lobster. Mm. And the top of this is, is interesting, especially. Um, oh, wow, those oh. polyps are beautiful. Wow, beautiful. Yeah. Zoom. Yeah, wow. Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you, Amber. Yeah, Mahalo, yeah. Amber. That's great. Yeah, the top of this uh, was especially interesting because it had, it looked like it had, a, as uh, Scott France has been pointing out, the, the trident shape. Yeah. Any chance we could get a look at the top part of this uh, bamboo? Oh, that's uh -huh. interesting. This is different. It looks like we've got multiple branching points, but not... It doesn't look like trident, does trident it? trident that we saw earlier. Yeah. Yeah, more zoom in there? Yeah, that's interesting. It looks like, well, we might have a, a trident there. It's just might maybe a different angle than we can see. Yeah, Scott's suggesting this is a trident, but um, maybe a mutant. Wow. Mm -hmm. We love our mutants, too. <laughs> so, uh, well well done. That's interesting. Um, let's see what science chat says here. Yeah, would it be possible? Yeah, could we hold here for a moment? Would it yeah, be possible? We're, we're making some decisions back here. Um, I'm seeing if I could get a different angle on an angle. Here. Okay. While we pull into a different angle, just to, just to let you know, if you do want to tune with uh, into uh, the control van through the studio and a ship to shore, um, it's available 24 hours a day. So no matter where you are in the world, we have uh, visitors in nearly every time zone um, stretching around around the world, we're happy to uh, to meet with you. Uh, available. Zoom in again. Also in a couple different languages. So, 
and join us for a ship to shore. It looks like scientists ashore are saying uh, no need to collect here. But it is really interesting to see where these are, it these is. are branching. Um, that was wonderful. And those polyps are stunning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yep, I think we're all set. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, from this angle you can you can see the start of the the candelabrum form. So one more zoom. Mm, excellent. Interesting. <laughs> Mahalo, you little mutant candelabra. <laughs> Amazing. Awesome. And mahalo to our hey. Pailako Mokulu'u, yep. our wonderful ROV pilots. That's right. Getting all of the best shots of <laughs> all of the mutant uh, <laughs> ko <laughs> <laughs> coral. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh yeah, this is another, um, yeah, aridogorgia, or, or looks, it looks like an aridogorgia, yeah. it's got the spirals. Yeah, that's uh, wonderful. Mm-hmm. So in the next 20 minutes or so, as we make our way to waypoint five, um, after we hit that waypoint, we're going to actually start heading up a bit of a steeper slope. Looks mm -hmm. like it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll be interested to see what's at uh, the top of waypoint six. So that might be a good place uh, once we get up to that area to pause for a few minutes, take a look around, and see see what see what we got. Sounds good. Yeah, it looks like between waypoint one and waypoint two is a pretty steep slope, and we've been hanging out on a couple small, small, much smaller change in elevation. Uh -oh, oh, here's a big arena gorge coming up. Oh, look at that. That's beautiful. That's gorgeous. Those are always so stunning. Yeah, spiral they are. stalks are just an incredible pattern. I think so. Yep. That is an interesting looking. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, wow. So is that a shrimp? I can't tell from this angle. Is that shrimp or one of those jellies? I'm actually having a really hard time with the... Yeah. Because it's about the right color for one of those little predatory jellies. Yeah, I think it actually is a predatory jelly. I think oh, so, yeah. That's wild. I don't I don't yeah. see antenna or legs. Yeah. Good spot. 
cool. That's wild. Yeah. Back. Yeah, you can see their Medusa tentacles actually pointing down and matching onto the branch itself. Wow, is that what that is? That's I think so. That is wild. I, I, I don't know. Oh, yeah. Right, sure enough, yeah, that's a jelly. That is great. Wow. It's just hanging on there. <laughs> wow. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> Time to go. Oh. Uh -oh. oh, there's two of them. Yank. Yeah, Adelina is getting ahead of us now. That's a pololia, a jellyfish. Yeah, the little the little red thing is a yeah. like a type of predatory jellyfish. Wonderful. It looks like there were two of them on that coral too. Mm -hmm. Oh. Mm -hmm. Veronica, uh, online watching from Kauai, uh, wanted to let us know that that, that kind of coral that we just saw, it's the Aretagorgia, can mm -hmm. grow up to 20 feet tall. 20 wow. feet tall, that's pretty That's pretty impressive. Interesting. Thanks for sharing that, Veronica. Oh, Veronica. They can get pretty Fun big fact. around here. The deep sea, it's good for tiny things, good for giants. <laughs> I would belong. <laughs> It's for everybody. <laughs> it's yes, for everybody. It is for everybody. It is for everybody. <laughs> there's some, uh, Veronica also wanted us to know there's some great pics for, uh, great photos of that jelly um, that we just saw in the uh, oh, Papahanao Mokuakea Marine National Monument Guide. Oh, wonderful. Um, so you can look up under hydrozoans and and, uh, oh, see. looks like we got another fish there too. Yes. Mahalo piha, Veronica. Thank yeah, you very mahalo, much. Mahalo. Yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah. Um, Scott France just mentioned that that, uh, that jelly is uh, aeginidae. Maybe uh, a genona species of a uh, predatory jellyfish. Where, yeah, that's really interesting. I actually don't believe I've ever seen one of those zoomed in like that. Very cool. Yeah, good spot. Good yeah. spot. Yeah, they do show up now and again around here. Yeah. Mm. Mahalo, Scott. Mahalo, Veronica. Yeah, mahalo, Nui. We love it. There's a fish on the right side of the screen. Oh, yeah. Oh. oh, looks like that's got a different tail than the ones we've been seeing, too. Maybe a... Well, I don't want to... Is it in? Oh, yeah, look at that. It's a morid... morid um choo, choo, choo. Wow. Yeah, more day. More day. Wow, look at that. It's got the tall spike on the front of it that makes me think it might be um um hmm. Yeah, it's got a different face. It's got a different shape of the face than the one of those that we saw yesterday too, which is kind of or so technically the day before in the last dive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. This is fascinating. Happens. Yeah, I think it might be. Uh, it's definitely a moridae, but it might be an Antimora species, which is really interesting. It's got a very pointy nose. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. And 
has a bunch of those downward uh, pointing whiskers. It's probably using to sense the, uh, uh, the seafloor. Oh, it does. Look at that. It's got uh, so. Actually, I think those aren't whiskers. Those might be uh, adapted um, uh, fins. Right. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's that's a uh, that's really interesting. The most uh, one of the more ex ex that's uh, it is very common though to use them sort of like barbells, which are those sort of. Um, those tentacles, and they will just sort of move along the seafloor. Right. There's also, a, yeah, a awesome, pair of uh, whiskers like, on the rostrum. They're smaller, it's like near the nose area I saw, yeah. kind of sticking out. So they would, would they use those as kind of like the same thing to like sense whatever is in front of them? Fish have a lot of, have several different types of sensory organs, organs so that could be, a, that could be one of them. That's really interesting. Yeah, that actually looks really similar to the... Oh, oh, another, another fish? fish. Another fish. Uh, fish. Oh yeah, that looks like that, um... See, so have viewers from earlier like asking, that. you shall receive. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's right. I think we need to get a fish count now. Uh -huh. Wow, that's beautiful too. Oh, it's got a white spot on it. Or is that, that might be a... Oh, stunning. Such a beauty. Yeah, that's amazing. The way that they swim is so mesmerizing. Yes, it's very distinctive. Mm -hmm. You can just watch the tail all day. So as we approach waypoint five here, I'm gonna call in a quick change in bearing. Do we wanna continue as a 0 0.3 knots working good? We're gonna start getting steeper now. If we, well, yeah. yeah, if we, if we're gonna stop and look at stuff, it's gonna be- Do you wanna slow it down quick. a little bit? Yeah. Yeah? All right. Yeah. Bridge now. Well, are we trying to cover ground or? I mean, I feel know? like we're making pretty good headway. We're already at waypoint yeah. five. Mm -hmm. um, could we uh, track a line at bearing 174 at 0 0.2 knots, please? Perfect, thank you. So now, is this more of those uh, nodules that you are interested in? What's uh, the, how do you differentiate I'm not convinced this? those are nodules. I think those might be fragments. Mm -hmm. Oh, looks like we might have a squat They're quite small. Yeah. Oh no, something. Mm -hmm. Zoom in. We got a star. Yeah, those those aren't nodules. Oh, so what are these? Just, uh, uh, just, just pebbles? fragments of rock just that have been rock. coming down with the, mm -hmm. what, uh, coming down from somewhere uphill, probably since uh, where we're headed toward oh, is such a, uh, you know, it's more, it's a local high and it's a fairly steep slope getting up to it. That that stuff that's probably coming off from somewhere up there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you can tell the difference based on sort of um, the angularity. Shape? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Manganese crusts are more rounded. Uh, mm. 
And by mind, they sort of resemble chicken nuggets. Oh, <laughs> chicken Maybe nuggets been in the oven a little too high. long. But uh, you're, you're likelier to find uh, ferromanganese nodule fields in flatter areas from what I've seen. Awesome. Yeah, it looks like they, they might have another fish there too. I think, I think they form more or less yeah, in situ. And these, these look like they've been uh, transported possibly a decent distance. Especially since we're also at the bottom of this local high that we're going to uh, start climbing. Makes sense that there's a lot of sediment here. Uh, what do we have here? Oh yeah, that's another fish. It's like a rat tail or something? Yeah, it looks like a, looks small, like a small one. A small one for sure. Yeah, so Scott's telling us that those uh, little predatory jellies that we saw on the, that are Regicordia are uh, not actually true jellyfish, but they're uh, instead a uh, hydra medusa. Uh, so they're, uh, they're part of the hydrozoans. wonder what those uh <clears throat> how, how those fish are thriving like uh you know what is it that they eat around here mm -hmm. um what is it that the uh the, the fish the grenadiers and the yeah oh yeah, just well, basically what, what yeah. we've been seeing in the last few minutes <laughs> um, <laughs> you gotta hit for food <laughs> <laughs> um Um, yeah, no, so a lot of these fish, you know, you'll see that they, they're sort of floating along the seafloor. I think there's some evidence that they will, um, will, will eat some of the, the items in the, that are within the substrate itself, but honestly, the, the food source of, of these fish, I'm not entirely positive. I know that there's, um, you know, so, something that we can't see here is, is the abundance of life within this sediment. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, there's, there's, yeah, there's often a lot of, uh, oh yeah, there's another fish right there. Um, you oh, know, big um, anemone in oh, the yes. lower left corner too. Yeah, worms and crustaceans in oh, the common. sediment are, are very common. And uh, as Scott France just mentioned also, um, amphipods and isopods. Gotcha. Um, so there's there's an abundance that actually is uh, very difficult to see too. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Sometimes you can see isopods hanging out on mm -hmm. the rocks, but um, they can be tough to spot sometimes. And again, mm -hmm. to that point of we don't know what we don't see. Yeah. If you have a. Uh, uh, worms and crustaceans hidden out in the sediment. We're going to miss the vast majority of those on these visual surveys. Mm -hmm. Although occasionally we do get to see some pretty cool tube worms. Yes. Uh, tube anemones. Yeah. 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 It is. It is really interesting. Um, you know, that used to be one of the uh, first ways to get information about the deep sea was was to take what they would call box cores so they would um, they would lower these large kind of square instruments that could then scoop the sediment up with it mm -hmm. um, and then they'd bring that back up to the surface hoping no rock had gotten between the scoops that closed to keep it all with them um, and they would look at, you know, the, the different worms and all the, the items that were on top of the sediment as well as within the sediment. Um, I think it's still a pretty common practice. It's, um, and it gives you a really good idea of the information in that one section. Um, Maybe yeah, that's seat interesting there, there too. Um, uh, yeah, and now they've got instruments that will take many small cores off of the side of a boat as well, um, called uh, a multi-core. Yeah, yeah they've done that in a lot of places. So when I'm looking through, um, oh yeah, it looks like another sea like uh, uh, curated collections at various geological repositories around the U.S., you'll see a lot of those uh, 
uh, sediment or push cores that uh, uh, people drop sure. down from ships or ROVs. All sorts of categories of sampling that people have done along the seafloor. Mm. Yeah. Another very tall Ritagorgia. Oh wow! It's actually got some uh, bare spots up at the up at its oh, tip. Oh, and another, another, nice. another sea cucumber. Oh, sea cucumber. And you can see the sediment yeah, in the I stomach. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Virginia, what causes the co uh, the coral branch to spiral like that? Um, I, it's actually just it's part of their branching style. It's the genetics. Oh. It's it's um, yeah, it's amazing. So beautiful. And it's so cool and so yeah. beautiful. It's really quite astonishing, actually, the, the branching of those chrysoporgids. Another wonder of nature. Yes, absolutely. I think, and one of the scientists on board just said how much they, uh, they wish to one day have enough mm -hmm. DNA and, and information on these to to understand the branching patterns. Wow. Um, and that was specifically about bamboo corals, but I, I think it'd be really interesting for some of these, Definitely. these other taxa that we see as well. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're getting out of uh, the sediment heavy area and back into lavas. <laughs> beautiful Pohaku, beautiful rocks for Very Dr. Val. So. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. We drove here last year and pulled up some just incredible rocks from the seamount. They've been a joy to work on in the lab. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, uh, something that uh, Scott Franz just mentioned was that actually um, while we see this beautiful corkscrew formation mm -hmm. on those aridic orgia, um, actually those the, the branches that give it that wonderful shape, the side branches, they come off actually only one side of the, the main skeleton, but because it's in a corkscrew, yeah. it gives you that beautiful um, sort of firework you know, display. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Wow, that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's kind of a wild jumble of some lava flows that have moved down this slope that we're looking at right now. So yeah, this is a pretty steep angle, so that explains all of the uh, rock fragments and stuff we were seeing down below. So mm -hmm. they're probably transported away from uh, uh, this or a nearby outcrop. <laughs> Our viewer, Veronica from Kauai, says that she remembers you bringing up those rocks, Dr. Val. <laughs> ah. <laughs> We're glad to have you back, that. Veronica, watching yeah. us. It's a pleasure. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's it's really interesting because I, uh, I took a look at some of the information from last year's, last year's dive because, you know, this... Uh, um, these cruises, they have such great uh, data reporting. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was able to, to very quickly yesterday, actually it was Kukui who showed me how to, how to look it up on yeah. the, you know, on the, the local server. And, um, you know, we're actually seeing somewhat different diversity of, of organisms um, than we did last year, which is really interesting. We're um, on the whole other side of the seamount. Right, yeah. you know. Um, last year, I think they, they did see bamboo corals, but they're slightly different. Um, it's uh, yeah, I've got uh, I've got a little bit of a, a write out on what they saw. Um, still a lot of these aridogorgias and such, but um, also they saw some really large um, sponges, sponges that they thought might be. Um, oh, I've forgotten. Uh, starts with an A, but. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of interesting because we we have definitely seen some sponges. We've seen a, cu a couple sponges, but we haven't seen the same one that they saw in um, 
I guess in abundance, in enough abundance that they took a sample of it last year. Pretty interesting. So, I think some of that was at similar depths as well. Mm -hmm. So, very interesting. And last year, last year included a microbial component of it. Very didn't much it? so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we had uh, Dr. Beth Orcutt uh, as the chief scientist last year, and uh, one of the things she's interested in working on is the relationships of microbes and uh, what's going on potentially with uh, manganese crusts. Microbes and manganese crusts. And she, she tried to uh, uh, specifically target very altered uh, rocks to do this exercise. Wow. So, um, I know she's working on that right now, uh, and you know, kind of like uh, the geochemistry and geochronology work that uh, my colleagues and I are working on. It's it's uh, uh, it's one of those things that takes a little time to do, and it, it can be pretty painstaking work. But uh, I'm I'm really excited to see what she learns because it kind of makes sense that there would be a relationship between uh, uh, microbes and the substrate around here. And, uh, well, anywhere on the mm -hmm. seafloor. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think we're going to learn a lot from that and figure out how, you know, if there's any sort of like chemosynthetic processes that are occurring uh, where the bacteria are actually using certain uh, uh, elements out of the rock. And, uh, and then, you know, obviously microbes are incredibly important to uh, the rest of the ecosystem around here. So how all that starts to tie into uh, uh, just how life balances itself out around here is, is going to be a really key thing to understand. Yeah. Microbes and manganese. Yep. Right. Balance of life on the seafloor. That's going to be a big, that's, an, that's going to be a bestseller. <laughs> <laughs> I see it coming. Yeah. Well, you know, you see these rocks and you think, oh, it's, it's just a, you know, I mean, not just a rock. I'm sorry about that. But, <laughs> yeah. it's, you know, it's a, <laughs> these rocks. It's a, you know, there's, oh, it's, dare you for I, I know, I'm, I'm, but, um, you know, when, you don't think that there's much biology in or around it, but in reality, there can be a there can be a community either on top of it, but also inside of these rocks. Very much so. I mean, yeah. uh, I think it was one of the uh, Joides resolution drill sites where people have actually drilled into subduction zones where you have crust being uh, uh, pushed under uh, another tectonic plate, and uh, usually inside. The, uh, the inside in? the mantle, and yeah, uh, they they drilled far enough in to sample some of these rocks that had been uh, that are kind of in the shallow portion of the subduction zone. Some scientists found that there are uh, uh, microbial populations in those rocks that are currently making their way down into the mantle. So yeah, these these microbes get everywhere. <laughs> wow, that's so. How how did you mention how deep into the um, I don't remember off the top of my head. I'll have mm -hmm. to go look that one up. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's you know, where there's a will, there's a way. Or as Jeff Goldblum <laughs> likes to say in Jurassic Park, life uh, mm -hmm. finds a way, <laughs> something like that. Mm -hmm. I actually, uh, there was an intern, um, that's her name, Chanel, um, who I got to intern with, and she's um, doing her PhD on um, microbes inside of uh, different substrates. And so she's kind of comparing... Uh, um, like the extracellular matrix and some of these various uh, cellular parts of these microbes to see how they differ from such extreme substrates. So she's using substrate mm -hmm. from Antarctica, actually. Wow. wow. Um, to analyze this, I believe. That's cool. Oh, there's another shrimp. Yeah, friend. it looks like there's another shrimp in there too. That's yeah. a, wow. That's really cool. And you can you can oh, yeah. Is it? Oh, okay. Think? So I'm looking. I'm looking up a little bit about these uh, subduction zone microbes, and uh, the, the authors awesome. of the study uh, are suggesting that subterranean life can play a role in removing carbon from subduction zones. They'll take carbon dissolved in water and convert it into a mineral within the rocks. So what I think of as alteration in some of these rocks, you know, uh, a process like this uh, yeah. could be one explanation for, uh, you know, some some of the alteration mineralizations oh, yeah. that, that, that we see in All various good. settings. Thank you. Yeah, it looked like there might have been some uh, uh, tinafores on that or something with some long... Um, uh, there was a green thing. One yeah. of those mysterious green things we kept <laughs> seeing last year and we have no idea what they are. Mysterious green thing, huh? 
Wonderful. Yeah. Leela, if you're listening, that's for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we tried to sample one on one of my watches last year, and we just couldn't get it off the rock because it's just so flat. They're nearly impossible to sample. That's so cool. And it looks like these are kind of different shape. This is yeah, bubbly almost. Is that pretty it, it looks, common? It, it looks like uh, rubble and maybe some very cracked lava flows. Hard, hard to tell through the crust, but yeah, the texture has changed a little bit. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, as, as, a, as a biologist, you know, these shapes are really important for changing slow currents. Um, uh, that can have a lot of impact on the local local organisms. Um, mm -hmm. So it's while it's not something that I might be able to identify exactly what type or, or reasoning behind it, it's really interesting to see these sorts of changes and and maybe it, even the changes of that with biology that happen um, as well. Yeah, I think we might be seeing like inside some of the pillows because on this uh, super slope here, that makes it a little bit. Uh, a little bit more probable that you'll see some of these uh, pillows collapse or break open at some point after they were in place. Yeah. So it's it's possible we're seeing some features like that. Interesting. Oh, we've got another another shrimp in there as well, and very cool. Fantastic. Our online viewers were uh, were primed yesterday for a lot of biology, so they're all uh, eager for for us to come up this ridge and uh, come across another magical coral forest. You can, you can it's never enough, is it? <laughs> Give so much, but we're about we're about halfway through, I think, uh, at least in time wise. I'm not sure about in distance. Um, halfway through this plan, the second dive of Ala Amwana Kaiuli, and uh, we're we're currently. Uh, sitting about 1,450 meters deep and exploring this kind of a steep climb now. Uh, a little bit of a steep climb up the side of this guillot, this, this seamount. Yeah, it looks like top side is very rainy again. Yeah. I'm wondering if I'm actually sure. hearing it on top of the control van right now. Yeah. I can't really tell. I know. Yeah, we've got a nice big rain system, plenty of ore. Oh, but I think yeah. there. I think that is rain over that here. Is rain. Oh, here's a stalked crinoid. Check this that out. That is beautiful. Wow. Such a vibrant red. Very vibrant. Yeah. I think this is the first stalked crinoid I've seen uh, on this expedition. Yeah. I don't know if the other watches have picked up any. Well, not picked up any, but seen any. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this let's, vibrant. Let's be precise wow. with the wording here, Val. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love the colors that some that of these crinoids is, have. They're just yeah. so spectacular. Especially with that contrast against the background of the lava. Yes, yeah. Nature imitating Agreed. art. Yeah, <laughs> nature is art. It sure is. <laughs> I'm curious, you guys that have uh, explored this area before, do you ever see the, um, the free swimming oh, crinoids? that's a beautiful shot. Thanks. I was going to try to grab that, so thank yeah. I'm glad you did. We're, we're having some fun back here with Stills Cam and this crinoid. Yeah. Any chance you could turn the lasers off? Thanks. Wow. Oh, that's a winner. That's beautiful. Wow. Whoa. That is stunning. Who would have ever guessed such a beautiful, delicate flower right. like? Just everybody's cool. kind of oh, taking on the this in the right ocean now. Floor. Wow. Yeah, that is stunning. Gosh. Constantly reminded of just the marvel of this place. So much incredible life and beauty. 
and, in a part of the world that's so poorly understood, but uh, this is a foundational part of our planet's story. So it's so, so amazing that we, we get to visit this space. You're seeing, you're seeing that beautiful stalked crino crinoid for the first time that any human has laid eyes on that yeah. particular crinoid. This whole, this whole realm, this whole ridge line. Uh, thanks for the wonderful view, front row. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh -huh. outstanding work from the pilots and nav uh -huh. and video engineer. Hmm. Virginia. Um, yeah. Do you um, do you know much about the free swimming crinoids and are those found in this area at all or? Um, the, the, so we've seen some unstocked crinoids, which, which those are the ones that can actually swim across. They're really cool. Okay. We saw them on the last sea mount. Okay. Um, we haven't, I don't know if we've seen any of the, the unstocked crinoids that can, um, actually get up and start and swim away. It's a really beautiful swimming. I think we may have some of the ones that are just parked, hanging out on some of the corals. Yeah. I, I have yeah. seen them start to like swim before in certain, uh, certain clips. Cool. Sometimes if you bug them, like if you accidentally uh, nudge them, they'll uh, uh, they'll go flying away. And watching them swim, yeah, we, I don't think we've seen one actively swimming uh, yet, but it's, it's, it's really so cool to just watch their thing. arms yeah. do their thing. Yeah. Yes. It's yes another halosaur. Is that what we have down here? Yeah, that's what it looks like to me. Cool. It's got the it's got the right skull shape. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Oh, there yeah. it goes. <laughs> a little camera shy, that one. Mm -hmm. All right, so looking at our current depth, um, I think once we get on top of this, uh, this, this local high where waypoint six is, uh, I'd be totally interested in looking out for a rock. So just a heads up there. Yeah, perfect. Sounds good. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So this area where we're diving actually has two distinct geo platforms located very close to each other. And very likely, in this, uh, this was all part of the, the same sort of volcanic system. But it's interesting to see the shape of those seamounts so far apart. So, or sorry, uh, the shape, uh, the shape of these seamounts so so close together and uh, just being so distinctly geo-like. So, you know, I've got all these questions in my head about the geology of these, and you know, is there going to be a geochemical difference between the two? Yes or no? Uh, and just what sorts of processes may have uh, uh, caused this volcanic platform to uh, kind of split into two different uh, distinct peaks? And uh, Last year when we dove around here, we were on the south end of the larger one of these structures, and today we're on the other end, uh, exploring the, uh, uh, the, the second and smaller of these structures. So between the, uh, between the sides of the uh, seamount that, we're, that we've uh, looked at uh, last year and today, and uh, just differences in location and everything, yeah, this is uh, quite a bit different than what we saw. So. It would be interesting to see if even the rock textures here are a little bit different than what we saw last year. Mm -hmm. Is that another stalked crinoid there? Is that a coral? No, it looks like another Arinogorgia, actually. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. Looks like a stolen nifrin right by it, too. Kind of encroaching on that rock. Oh, yeah, looks like maybe. Wait. Hmm, I can't tell. Yeah, that's a beautiful word of word So here. delicate. And as we zoom oh, out, yeah. we can see some of these large pillow basalts, these boulder sized pillow basalts. You can see that's where uh, some of these anemones and corals are uh, preferentially putting down roots because that gets them up into the current where it's, uh, where they have uh, better access to uh, uh, nutrients in the water column. Yeah, yeah, that's a, it's a really important. And also those big boulders are uh, steadier than these little uh, pieces of rubble. Absolutely, yes. Far steady, far more stable. Um, 
Mm -hmm. I don't know if that message went. I think the internet might be having some issues. I don't know if that's weather related or not. Yeah, I'm having some issues yeah, with the still that. cap here. Okay. Yeah, the images aren't popping up. Mm. Okay, I'll uh, call down to do that. Hang on a sec, I'll go send a message to the team leads. Oh, there we go. Wow. The side over there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, this guy right here. Yeah. This person. What is that? Our third Okala, our third anemone of the morning? That's one of the ones with the really long yeah. uh, tentacles oh. that can blow really in the canthus. breeze. Thank you. Yeah, it took <laughs> me a minute as well. Yeah. I thought I hit still. Can. Yeah, it's a. Uh... Oh, no. I can't even send a message down to the team leads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think our internet's down. Uh, yeah. Are we online? Are we broadcasting? No data, no data. I couldn't get it to pull up. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, I wonder uh, if we're having I a little bit of an issue with the water, but, or oh, with the weather. Check. Water. Yeah. <laughs> same, same. <laughs> Beautiful sea anemone. Look at how big they are. Yeah. Wow. Those are gorgeous. Mm hmm. Big squat lobster on that one. Really What's gorgeous. this right here? That's a different color. It looks like another. Uh, yeah, I think it's a tall, it's a different type of anthemesis. There's oh. some that are red and some that are orange in the area. Oh, okay. This I don't might, think have I've its, seen might have its um, arms kind of I'm in. I'm not sure I've seen an orange anthemesis before. Looks like another one of those. Either shrimp or predatory jellies on the Radagorgia on our left. I'm seeing a shrimp oh, yeah, and something like small and orange yeah. on oh, it. Oh, yeah, the associate there. Yeah. Wow, that is stunning. Oh, yeah, that looks like an anthemastus. Yeah, I've never seen one that color. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is beautiful. And Okay, it claims I've sent the message, but it hasn't been received yet. So. Ah, yeah. Oh, and I just lost chat. <laughs> Those streams are down. We might be reloading now, though. Oh. There we go. I think yeah, we're back. We're back yeah, we're back. Woohoo! Ah, uh, yeah. Looks like uh, Kevin mentioned that they lost video on shore there. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Lots of sad viewers, temporarily sad <laughs> yeah. viewers, but they stuck it out. Stayed oh, we got another shrimp us, and so. uh, paragorgid. That's beautiful. We're back. One with the corallids. That's stunning. <laughs> All right, we think we're back online. So if, if you can hear me, we're dealing with a little bit of weather topside, and I'm wondering if that's interfering with our satellite connection a little bit. So please be patient with us. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot control the weather around here. <laughs> this is a very weather prone part of the ocean. So. Ah, yep. Um, Matt just confirms back. that um, we had a little rain fade and we're reacquiring the satellite link. So, all's good. We did get to see some beautiful Ritagorgias while the feed was out. Um, some of their associates. 
But uh, by and large, we're still uh, just around halfway through this dive. Um, just over 1,400 meters deep. It's still on Loudon Sea Mount. Mm -hmm. We haven't done any major jumps since mm -hmm. uh, the five minutes ago when the feed, <laughs> feed went out. So thanks for sticking with us. Um, this is the 8 to 12 watch. Um, just having a great time exploring this kind of steep, the steep pitch uh, on the ridge line up to a little local, little local summit. Would be our sixth waypoint of the dive. And uh, mm -hmm. excited to see what we find up there. Time for poetry, Dan. Oh, always, <laughs> always time for you yes. and always time for poetry, my oh, Always. Okay. This is from Julie Williams. Get, get your tissue box ready. <laughs> <laughs> not, not today, not this morning. We'll save that one for later, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> o seas that touch Hawaii shore, pulled by the moon from the ocean's floor, rising high in the tide flows, falling low, out the tide goes. Pai ke kai. O oh, winds that blow, gentle or strong, create the waves that surge along, the waves that break all day, all night, the waves with crests like caps of white. Pa ma, pa ka uh, makani. Come on, boy. Pa ma makani. Mm -hmm. A little bit of wind, a little bit of makani, a little yeah. bit of ua rain yeah, for us now. Yeah, definitely. Perfect. A little ua today. fade. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, we'll see another anua anua when we, after this shift. Hi, Aloha. Always a good sign. Yeah. I think we're back on. I got my internet back. <laughs> yeah, thanks for checking. Amazing yeah. expedition lead checking up on us. Yeah. Making sure making we weren't sure. lost with the internet connection. <laughs> yeah, I was looking at one of the winch cams. I'm like, ooh, that doesn't look good out there. And then we could hear the rain start to come down yeah. on the van. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> It's another amazing part of being on this team is getting to see all of the leadership at play um, and on display from uh, our expedition leaders and the ship captain, folks who are managing these systems that are having to operate with high levels of precision 24 hours a day and making a lot of decisions on the fly with new information, changes in weather, um, technical challenges with some of the ROVs. So it's really just a, it's amazing to watch. Um, it reminds me of being on the voyage in canoe. Mm -hmm. Same kind of exceptional leadership. Uh, yeah. Yes, most definitely. I, and at sea and really anywhere, one of, one of the things I always uh, uh, like, like to think, one of the ways I always like to think about this is uh, little problems can quickly become big problems, mm -hmm. especially out here where, you know, we, we're the only people <laughs> able uh, to take uh, to uh, support ourselves at the moment um, directly you know we have tons tons and tons of onshore support but if you know we need to repair something or uh, you know take care of uh, any any sort of issue around the ship um, yeah that's something we have to be right on top of mm -hmm. and right. if you let a small problem just kind of sit you know you don't know if that's going to turn into a bigger problem eventually very quickly that will affect you know, all of us or our science goals or the expedition. So yeah, it's really important to keep on top of all that. And it that's is. one of the things I really like is that um, there's pretty tight communication on the boat when there's uh, when there's anything that needs to be addressed. And it usually gets taken care of right away. So, you know. It does, it does. People are quick to respond to challenges and everyone's more than happy to do their job and do it well. Yeah, um, sometimes a big, we have to get creative, creative, which is always really cool, too. So. <laughs> it sure is. Yeah. yeah. Oh, called it. The rocks are starting to look really good as we're heading up toward uh, waypoint six. So um, fingers crossed, it's it's uh, looking excellent up there too. <laughs> <laughs> the 
valves ready, ready hey, for a sample. It's yeah. almost rock o'clock. Rock o'clock. Oh, I need a. I like that oh, one. <laughs> oh yes. Rock o'clock. Well played. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> oh. We got something. Oh yeah, it looks like we've got some more chrysogorgids. Uh, and we've oh, got yeah. another one here. They're, they're kind of blending in around here. Yeah, it's it's actually one of the things that makes it kind of difficult in um, in some of these substrates with a lot of uh, rocks with like sand on them. They can um, they can kind of blend in. That one's beautiful. That actually reminds me of the chrysogorgia geniculata, but I'm not I'm not positive on that ID, but it is definitely.